back to another episode of Synchris. My name is Charles Van, LA-based sync agent from Blue Buddha Entertainment. I have a very special guest in the studio today, LA-based music supervisor, uh, Katie McElvain. Welcome, Katie. So good to have you on the show today. How's it going? It's going well. Thank you. How are you? Doing good. Doing good. Good. Really stoked to be able to sit down and have a chat about some of your amazing work. Most recently, I know you just music supervised uh, A24's The Front Room, which stars Brandy. It's currently in theaters. And before we take a deeper dive into the nuances of your job as a music supervisor on that, sh on that theatrical film, I would love to turn the mic to you, Katie, and hear about how you broke into music supervision because I know everybody's path is different. And, um, you know, what, uh, what led you into music supervision? Well, I was a really bad musician. Uh, I grew up, my dad is very musical. So he always made sure that I had, well, and my mom too, uh, made sure that I had piano lessons and I put transitioned to percussion. I had played the upright bass for a couple of years and I really didn't care enough to learn theory and practicing was a very tense thing in my house because it was sort of like, you know, I, I would take a stand and it was on practicing because I knew it was important to my parents and I was oh. <laughs> a little brat. Um, <laughs> and so, and then I, and then performing made me in extremely uncomfortable too. So I was like, well, if I don't like practicing and I don't like theory and I don't like performing, I don't think I should play music, but I still loved music. And so I wanted to be involved in some way. Um, and so at, uh, when I was in high school, I decided that, you know, performance was not going to be the route that I was going to go down. Uh, mm -hmm. but I was going to try and do anything I could to make money for the people who loved that life and who were good at it and who, you know, made these beautiful songs that were so moving that I was never going to be able to do myself. Um, mm. And so I started looking at, I, I mean, it was a pretty early decision to go into the music industry. I'm not one of those people who's like, oh my gosh, I was, you know, like working as a geologist and I just tripped and fell over a rock <laughs> and now I'm here. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so I uh, decided I wanted to go to school for music business. And this was in the early 2000s, like 2005-ish. That was really big, but I still didn't, it, I didn't make the connection that music supervision was the thing. So I decided I was going to go into A&R. And I yeah. got to college and everybody was like, oh yeah, because you know, A&R is dead. And Externally, I was like, yeah, a &R is dead. And internally, I was freaking out because I didn't know a &R was dead. And I disagree with that now. But, yeah. you know, at the time, I had no idea. Um, and so I was like, well, I guess I'm not going to go into a &R. What am I going to do? And so people started talking about music supervision. And so I, you know, latched onto that pretty early in college and have just sort of geared myself towards it ever since. Um, and then in hindsight my mom told me a fun story she was going back through some stuff and cleaning out old boxes and apparently i had taken one of those aptitude tests in high school about what kind of job i would be good at and mm -hmm. she claims that i got a music supervisor result no. on it, which was what i mean i was surprised that an aptitude test in you know 2007 would even know what a music <laughs> supervisor was but <laughs> Right. Apparently it was uh, destined to be so. <laughs> Very nice. It was spot on. And it sounds like, Katie, you know, <clears throat> having that passion for music and obviously the ear for it, you know, I came from the label side. So we share that a and uh, DNA, if you will. And I think that's a great segue because the alternate universe of the front room as created by the directors Max and Sam Eggers, who I know there were also the writers on it, has, if you want to touch and talk about working with the directors, working with the music editors and composers and crafting this alternate universe and the importance of the music selection. I know you, a lot of, correct, the Sonic template was 60s and 70s soundtrack. So I'll turn the mic to you if you want to talk about 
what's sort of that initial creative process when you're working with the directors and and the, and the writers? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a question we get asked a lot. I'm sure you get this too, is like, mm -hmm. what kind of music do you like? And the answer really is everything. And, you know, I think it, um, it comes down to a quality because never would I ever have answered that I like, you know, country gospel music from the 50s and 60s. It's not my go-to, but this is the world we stepped into. And it was so fun to, um, you know, that's what I love about music supervision is it's so story-driven. It's so character-driven. So you don't know what kind of genre you're going to become an expert in really quick, you know? Yeah. Um, so with this one, they sent me the script before they had shot anything because there were some things in the script. And so we started looking early for... The song called Hold Fast to the Right, which is a public domain hymn. And mm -hmm. there was a line in it. Um, there's, you know, the, the story of the script is very much about this play between who will be the real mother in the house. And so this character who is like the son, you know, there's this line about kneel down by the side of your mother, my boy. And wow. they, they love that line. Okay. Um, and so they knew they, they had scripted that song and they knew they wanted that song. And so I pulled a few different recordings, different versions of that song and vetted them, which, mm. you know, th because they wanted to play it on set. And so you had to have it vetted prior to going into shooting. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we picked that early on and that really set the tone of the, of the music. It, it kind of determined you know, the instrument, instrumental world, um, and it fit really well with what they were looking for, what they were hoping mm -hmm. for, and everything else kind of stayed in that pocket. Wow. That's, that shows, correct, Katie, the level of, that's the creative side. Now let's flip the coin and talk about the clearance side, because I know some of these copyright owners' songs were, you know, more than 50 years old. And let's talk about, correct, uh, you might be licensing songs from bands or artists who might have passed away, and then you're dealing with their estate. What, what's kind of that uh, process in tracking down the rights owners for, correct, two sides of the coin, the master and then the composition? Well, that is always fun on older stuff because there was no such thing as sync when these mm. songs were being created. So there weren't clear lines of who, you know, represents it and, and everything like that. And so, wow. you know, as these things get passed along and a lot of, you know, Max and Sam were really excited to find sort of hidden gems that had kind of uh maybe never reached the mainstream or fallen out of the day-to-day -day commercial music pop certainly certainly not commercial music pop of today um <laughs> and so that was that was a fun challenge and it was a lot there was a lot to learn there i didn't realize you know sometimes you go into these and i didn't realize they wanted to use this song and i didn't no, all of the multiple people who had recorded a version of this song back in the day. So yeah. while you have this recording that you think maybe we can be flexible on, when mm. you get into the publishing and the underlying composition, mm. you realize that actually this song has made these songwriters so much money over the decades that whether or not you're using a well-known recording, doesn't matter because they're used to making bank off mm. the composition of this song. And so they're going to, you know, negotiate with you based on their track record with the song, not on your track record with well, how many times you've heard the song before. Right. Wow. So that, that lends itself. If Katie, also, if you want to touch on, cause I know, you know, sort of the, matrix so to speak and the rabbit hole you can enter is correct oftentimes the publishing shares for some of the writers will change over time and then you're pulling detective and trying to figure out who has the current rights 
Yeah, I mean, I I love playing detective. I think that's why this is a good job and why I keep coming back for more. I think, you know, if you don't yeah. kind of take that approach to the clearance side, it can be a little frustrating. But I always say it's how I live out my inner Nancy Drew. Um, yeah. And it's it's fun and it's exciting. And especially, you know, it, there's a sense of accomplishment when you go to look for copyright holders and mm -hmm. it's it's a no or it's a dead end but you know the tricky part is that it has to work in the greater scope of the post process yeah so what it comes down to is whether or not the producers and directors will clear the way for you to have the time to keep digging and keep mm. trying to chip away at finding these copyright holders. And so I see. on this project, we had an, a situation, we had a scene where they really liked a song, they weren't sure, and we were pulling some alts and, you know, we found, they found this version of this little light of mine that uh, everybody loved. And I, absolutely could not find any clearance parties and so i kept digging and i kept digging and i finally came to a website that had a contact form and i thought oh it's happening so i submitted you know a contact form and mm -hmm. never heard back and it was very old i mean this was a website out of 2003 like wow. there was no you know everything was like lime green and like <laughs> times new roman font and it was very uh basic yep. and so i didn't hear back and so you know th this song kept coming up in conversation and that's where it's like you know it comes down to the directors like do they have to decide and move on or do we have time and are we gonna you know keep everything else on hold to make sure that we get the answer that we need on this and mm -hmm they kept pushing and the song kept coming back up in conversation. So I decided I was going to take a different approach. So I went to the internet and found the names of the members of the band of the group and <laughs> figured they were all probably passed away by now. So I started Googling their name plus obituary. And oh, so then wow. I started finding their obituaries and I read their obituaries to find, you know, at the end where it says so-and-so is survived by yeah. da 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 uh -huh. So I found who they were survived by. And then I started Googling the names of their children oh, who themselves were by now in their seventies. Um, and so finally I, I got a breakthrough. I found a son who not only was contactable, but lives in Nashville and works in the music industry. So he understood what sync was. He was familiar yeah. because that's the other thing is, you know, once you reach these people, there's this mm -hmm. level of education and yeah. if they don't know what kind of answers you need, you're probably not going to get the ones you need. And so right. I found this guy and he, he was able to get everything pushed through for us. And, it wasn't in time though. And so it didn't work for this scene that we wanted to have it on camera, but he had so gone to the mat. What it wound up being was that it turned out that this recording was on a major label that shall not be named. Sure. And we, uh, we got approval. And then mm -hmm. at the last minute I said, okay, great. Can you send me the official audio? And they said, oh, we don't have any. Oh. Oh. oh no. And so the son uh -huh. dug through everything in his house, found an old LP of the song, digitized it, mm -hmm. provided it to the label so that the label would have their own official audio. Yeah. So that they could send it to me so that I would have an official paper trail on everything. And it just didn't happen in time. But he had gone so far wow. out of his way that it stayed in my head and my heart. And so when we were looking for a song in a different spot, I was like, <laughs> guys, you, I'm really hoping that we can get this one across the line, even if it's in a different seat. And so we were able to when we got to use it. And that was great. That felt really rewarding to have yeah. everybody 
uh, you know, everybody just like go to bat for it and have it yeah. work out. Katie, that from A to Z is such, you know, for all our listeners, it shows the amount of work, not only on the creative side, the clearance side, and then it takes a village. And if you want to share, Katie, because I would love to hear, you know, in the short sort of how many alt mixes, you know, if you want to talk about spotting sessions and you're, when you're meeting and then you're playing up tracks to picture, correct some of, some of your turnaround time, like in this scenario, I mean, it could be really quick or you could have time, but each case is different. And what's, what's that like with spotting sessions? And, and do you typically have like one or two alternate mixes as a backup? If you know, and foresee clearance might be, you know, uh, an issue. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for me, I always want to get the director's first choice, whatever that is. If they're happy, mm -hmm. I'm happy. Yeah. Um, and the only time that we start talking alts is when there is like a clearance snafu, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Or if they are coming at it from a blank slate and saying, we don't have anything for this scene. What are your ideas? Then I'm, pro I'm going out and I'm going through I'm going to different music libraries. I don't make it a habit to go to individual artists because time, time again, I've seen that artists don't fully understand the world of sync. And so yeah. I feel more confident in my clearance when I know that there's a sync rep who's serving as an intermediary who has made sure that all the rights are where they need to be and all the percentages add up to 100%, not 99.99%. Right. And so I go to a bunch of different sync reps and I get ideas and I get hundreds of ideas and I go through them. And then we have a conversation with the directors. Are you looking for, you know, your top, my top three ideas, my top three suggestions, or is the creative pretty open on this and I should send you... 20 because you just wow. kind of want to go through and you know and I think it comes down to the director's creative process too I think for Max and Sam they really enjoyed digging through things and mm. and finding that thing that made them feel like they had found it so sending them yeah. two or three options felt like I was taking that exploratory process away from them um mm. but then you know there's other times where people are like it just what did I hire you for? You tell me what songs sure. are going to work, you know, like find some, that's some things. So right. it depends on the person. It depends on the creative. So yeah, so I'm going out, I'm finding a bunch of different songs and then I'm suggesting them. And then, you know, we come to a creative decision and we move forward. And then based on how the clearance process is going, that is when I will advise that, you know, we, need to start thinking about, you know, don't get temple up here. Don't get too attached right. because we're having some issues versus like, okay, now we really have to start picking our backups, identify those songs. And I'm going to start simultaneously clearing them because I'm not feeling good yeah. about our first choice. And then we see how it shakes out and you know, what the approvals are and when they come through and then we see what what settles in there but um it's yeah it's a lot of you know it's a lot of trying to be open about communication mm -hmm. and you know let the directors know that you're still pushing you're still fighting for that creative choice that is their number one um yeah. but also wanting to kind of be responsible about making sure that we have something <laughs> yeah no it's you know the collaboration component katie you know thanks for breaking that that down if we want to talk about because oftentimes if you look at songs that were licensed in the actual film versus what the soundtrack looks like and we can spend some time here katie would love to you know how in this case with the front room did the final soundtrack differ from the initial script well it grew a lot there were two or three songs in the initial script and we i think we had like 13 in the end with that on camera which was mm -hmm. added um from the initial script that i read so 
you know, I I don't necessarily know if the sound changed. We we played with a lot of different things, um, and in the end, I think they stayed true to what they had scripted. Mm-hmm. Um, but the scope of the music needs really grew, which was really fun and exciting for me, of course. <laughs> very nice, very nice. And I think you know, tying it back, Katie, to our initial startup in this conversation about A and R. And you as a music supervisor, me as a sync agent, threading that needle of authentic artists and advocating for independent artists, uh, whether it's also um, by POC artists, AAPI artists, me as a sync agent, there's so much music out there and independent artists for them to break into the music industry is 30 times more difficult than it was back in the 90s and 2000s with the immense competition. But would love to thread the needle and and talk about some of the, you know, blues, rock, vintage ar- artists. Were there any indie artists that were 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 synced up uh, to picture? Uh well, you know, I think the song that I mentioned, "Hold Fast to the Right," that was a small, you know, that was a small label, and it they represented their arrangement of that version. It was not with a major. We did we did have um, a few opportunities on this one to kind of go uh, to some of the smaller artists and Mm -hmm. um, smaller labels and publishers uh, and really feel like we were working with people who this was going to make a difference to them. Whereas, you know, some of the majors, this just a drop in the bucket for them, but this is going to be something that was really exciting to maybe not the, the people who made the music, because I'm not sure they're still with us, but mm. definitely mm-hmm. the people who are representing the music and, you know, any anybody still affiliated with their estate and everything. Yeah, very nice. You know, it's something that we both share, you know, our passion for music uh, and working with independent artists. And if you want to spend some time, Katie, because correct, I know also you have, you represent a library of tracks artists that you also um pitch as well i do yeah i think that's one of the things that i learned when i got into music supervision is that you're really on the side that represents the filmmakers and it takes you away from working with the artists and i didn't want to fully remove myself from that i wanted to know that i had numbers in my phone that i could call up you know and it wasn't just like only ever working with reps um and so i did start a catalog and you know it's definitely something that uh we try and weave into as much of the you know signings and artists as possible and just with the accessibility i know you guys are doing a lot too with blue buddha because there's so much you know it's, it's a very confusing world and and that's one of the things that i see a lot like we're we're launching a new thing because i see so many artists who there's all these offerings out there that are very in the ideation phases and then independent artists get to the point where they're like okay now you're on your own and they're like oh my gosh this is overwhelming you know so we're trying to launch a uh social media content calendar plan because so many people, you know, I've, I've had artists on my roster and talk with so many artists who, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun to go through and like pick out what kind of, you know, what your promo photos would want to look like and, you know, mm-hmm. for your feed, like what's your color palette going to be. But then when it comes into that accountability of executing that and staying consistent with it, that's mm. where sort of, you know, the cream rises to the top a little bit because it is that consistency. And I'm sure you can talk to this too, that, you know, you see these people with amazing music and as a sync rep, you (laughs) want them to be as big of a deal as they want to be. And then they just have like deep insecurities about posting to social media or something. And it's like, you know, you make great music, but people are only going to know if you tell them you know, and I'm out there, I'm telling them, you're out there, you're telling them, but it's still sort of like, it, it, it removes that level of authenticity when they're not talking about it themselves. And it, it, you know, it 
sort of it's there's this disconnect or they might become thought of as just like a sync project because if your sync agent is hitting mm -hmm. you too hard right. people are gonna think that's all you're about so you gotta let them know that you got more going on you know and that can only yeah. come from the artists themselves but it is in this oversaturated world it is so yeah. hard to do that so we're trying to see if we can kind of support people in mm -hmm. some you know more more of the more of the execution a little bit more of the you know accountability to keep people going because especially if you're a solo artist it's so hard to do that on your own yeah. and yeah. uh yeah you know we love we love supporting all sorts of people and if that's what it, if that's the difference maker you know between somebody who has you know <laughs> grown up in Los Angeles and went to high school with somebody whose dad is, you know, an exec at a label versus an mm -hmm. artist who grew up in, you know, Kansas and doesn't have the same kinds of ties to the industry, then how can we support so that it is a little bit more of an equitable, equitable playing yeah. field for people? Yes, couldn't agree more 100%. And I'm always curious, Katie, because, you know, social media and Spotify plays and engagement. So when you get pitched an indie artist, and if we have those bullet points, you know, I know at the end of the day, it comes down to the song and the creative. But if you know, oh, okay, this person's got, there's a, they're mid-level, they're touring, they have their fan base. Does that help encourage you? You're like, All right, I'm, I'm going to give this a listen ahead of my five others 5000 songs i have in my inbox um you know i'm i'm human and if somebody's excited about something i'm probably going to get more excited about it too and yeah. so if no if if there's no activity if there's nothing fresh then right. you know if the song works and it's great then that's great but if there are multiple songs that work and are great and we could go in either direction and someone has built more of a narrative i'm not looking at you know do you have 900 followers versus do you have 9000 or more followers but i'm looking at you know is this something you're currently working you know is this something yeah. that you are currently presently passionate about and working towards your dreams i want to be on that on board with that with you, you know, versus yeah. the person who's like, oh, I made this in my bedroom and then I went to my day job and like, I'm just trying to, you know, like make some money off back end royalties. And it's like, well, I mean, okay, like if your song's good, your song's good. Um, right. It's definitely a different uh, business model. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I like getting, you know, feeling an emotional connection and getting excited about stuff. So yeah, connection performing live because when when if there's a meet and greet or op opportunity for artists you know to translate their music to you live in that live performance that connection like you said you know is invaluable because you're going to always remember that artist remember that song and then hopefully a script comes up or a brief in a scene that works you're going to remember um that given artist but yeah i'm just curious some um, you know want to spend some time as well as far as you know current events and you know advocating for artists independent artists by poc artists aapi artists because it's interesting and we can touch on it you know out of you know the the writer and uh actor strike from last year you know the pipeline uh there's fluctuations in the market uh still looking at you know opportunities for independent artists um but being a realist you know things more than ever are so competitive so what are some of you know what are the things that you can touch on as far as you know advocating for indie artists and you know your passion for helping uh by poc and aap artists and if you want to touch on that sort of your 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 roadmap there yeah, well, and I, you know, I also think there's uh, a, still a, a, an imbalance of, uh, you know, just women identifying people, especially behind the mic, you know, behind boards and stuff too. So that's something yeah. that I can more 
personally, I have more of a lived experience with that. And that's a big thing for me too. But, you know, we're chatting today, the day after Missouri executed uh, Marcellus Williams, who was very much believed to be innocent. And we saw this go up to the Supreme Court and they denied his stay of execution. And, you know, my my heart is heavy thinking about him and his loved ones, um, but also, you know, other people who are currently going through very similar experiences. I don't know if you pay attention to the Innocence Project at all, but there's people, there are people all the time who are, you know, wrongly convicted and on death row. And it's, um, it's a really hard time. And, and it's also a really divided time in our country. You know, we've got our lovely little election coming up. And that is, you know, I think music is one thing that people can really come together with and have a lot in common. Yeah. And it is this, you know, like we were talking about, like the, there is more of an opportunity than ever for indie artists, but it's very much about what you make of it yourself then. Mm. Um, and so it's a very challenging dynamic to try and figure out like, what is, um, what's, what's possible on what budgets and mm. who can you help lift up and support. And I think it comes down to a daily commitment to trying to not just for me, at least my experience, especially with my catalog is I get pitched music from people who want to be on the roster mm -hmm. who are all very much they're super skilled super talented totally understand sync it would be such a breeze to sign them and have their music on the roster but they're all from one particular demographic <laughs> and so it's a little bit of extra work to go out and like make sure that you're clearing a path to have some artists from other backgrounds and other yeah. lived experiences come forward and make yeah. sure that their music is getting support and attention as well. And I think that, you know, justice in our entire country can, mm -hmm. uh, it's a, it's a big problem and we've got to face it on a lot of fronts, but I hope that, you know, everybody does whatever they can every day in their own little pocket of the world. So we do what we can in our little music yeah. industry and hopefully I won't make a song that touches somebody, but hopefully one of my artists will, and that'll help change the world. <laughs> yeah, no, no. And that's, that's, I love that Katie. Cause also, you know, it's, it's interesting because with social media, it's sort of like, because of the algorithm of depending on what you follow or what it, that perpetual loop, all you see is depending, you know, what you follow or like, and that's fascinating because same with, you know, if, within the scope of indie artists if i'm just following bands in the alt rock lane that alt rock artists are going to come up on my feet and like you said there's a whole plethora of amazing artists worldwide you know we can it's just fascinating because i had a chat the other day with um ron x uh smash mouse manager manager we we're talking about you know him in the 90s and 2000s coming up being a r at a label and our focus was just the five artists that were on our wall. Or if you went to Tower Records and went through the vinyl collection and said, oh, here's some other artists I can check out. Now it's in, the, in our pocket on Spotify. Millions of artists. So that's, that said, Katie, because um, I know, you know, just to s spend some time on it, what's your workflow process? Because uh, I know you're getting pitched daily, every second. L labels publishers indie reps artists themselves managers so it must there must be floodgates i mean how do you sort of balance you know i can only imagine what your inbox must look like how do you manage that process <laughs> yeah i mean i definitely have sub inboxes where things are auto filtered and then when i have time and i'm in the right state of mind i go and seek out the new stuff and and you know it's it's that balance of um this is work for me so you mm -hmm. know i i have to get through 
some at least i have to get through as much as i can but i still want to find joy in it and you know yeah. make sure that i'm doing it in a time and in a setting that i'm not just swiping through listening to 30 seconds and moving on to the next one for the sake of consuming as much as i can but i'm actually in a place where you know my mind and heart are open and i can get caught off guard by something amazing that i just heard um and so mm -hmm. that can be difficult to manage um i this is this is veering off traffic a little bit but it's been my i think it would be so cool if there could be some kind of organization that creates like a, a co-op of artists to create a streaming platform that is paid more equitable and run by artists and like active artists get votes on how things work and stuff, you know, because I think, you know, as we see tech coming in and taking over, um, I think I just saw something that said like the CEO of Spotify is worth like $4 billion and like no artist ever on Spotify has ever been paid out anywhere close to that. And so like, you know, these people are, are look, Spotify is a marvelous technology and mm -hmm. I thank them for bringing it into the world. And now I would like the indie artists of the world to come in and take that technology and make it their own and get those streaming rights back, get those royalties. I love that. Maybe out of this uh, chat today, because I think a consortium needs to happen, like you said. Just think of like Spot or what was it? SoundCloud, MySpace. And in its infancy, you know, when it was true, you know, just what you found is what you got. They're total indie. And it's, you know, to bookend it, like, you know, the model of the majors without naming them, the, you know, being their market share and what they get out of the streaming mechanical royalty from Spotify. It's, 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 it's not a surprise there. And like you said, you know, uh, talking with, I was talking with artist managers is, you know, the only way for the cream to rise to the top is you see the time and time and time, the same artists that there's ad money being put, put in to boost their tracks. So yeah. the disparity if you're an indie artist, you need money to boost your, you know, boost your tracks. And, and by then it's not even making a dent, but that's a fascinating yeah. Katie that, you know, maybe at the next guild of music supervisor, that's something that, you know, needs to be talked about. That's, yeah. I don't think the guild would do it. I think, I think the pitch people like need to, you know, come up with our own collective and mm. because it's a very different side of things and and as a music supervisor and a company and a, a sync roster owner i i i hope i'm you know in a unique position to yeah. kind of understand the nuances of both and like the needs are really not the same for both and you know music supervisors are looking out for music supervisors and our film and television industry faced for the most part and you mm -hmm. know the 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 pitch companies who are on the front lines with the artists. It's a different thing and we need, we need to have our own collective. So yeah, maybe we can start it. <laughs> yes, yes, I love that. And cause it's, you know, like you said, time and time again of our role with working with independent artists, it's like one part, the education process. Cause so many, you know, and that's why I've also, you know, during the shutdown, I pivoted and I, you know, have a sync course because if you tell an artist, you know, composition, rights, PRO, it could be Greek to them and, 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 and them not realizing the back end performance income, mailbox money, and how to do it the correct way to monetize their music. But yeah, amazing yeah. Um, insights. I'm just curious, um, what's kind of the rest of the year look like for you as far as whether film or TV, um, things you might can touch on. Um, yeah, I'm working on a few, uh, Christmas films with Joel C. High. That's fun. Um, and like I mentioned with Dawn Patrol on the catalog side, we're going to try and launch that, uh, like content calendar to kind of be that next step for artists in their accountability to, you know, just sort of help add a little structure so they don't have to tap into their self-discipline they can 
save that for their music and we can kind of help support on the self-promotion side, which is so tricky. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think, you know, those are definitely the two biggest things on the radar right now, but you know, there's, there's a lot of days left in the year. We'll see what comes up or, you know, maybe November 20, whatever date Thanksgiving is, will hit and I'll decide that that's it. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you never know. And then wrap it up for next year. But I uh, always like to to end the chat on a, a cool, fun, um, what's on repeat right now on your Spotify playlist? Is there any particular well, track? Use Spotify if I can right. help it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Let's say your disco playlist, what's on repeat? <laughs> well, so I just found um, this new from one of my artists uh, because she was featured. I found this new playlist called Rainbow Rodeo and it's oh. queer country artists. So oh. I've been loving that. Um, my good friend, who you may know as well, Lauren Ronaldo, um, she took me out to a show for one of her uh, and Crush's upcoming artists named uh, Sophia Zella. She's fantastic. Such a powerhouse. Love that. Um, and yeah, I think those are a few. Oh, uh, 3% is an mm. indigenous group out of Australia that just huh? released a new album. I've been listening to that a few times. And, you know, I I too love um, the trends and the pop and the latest. Uh, and so, you know, I love me some Chapel Roan and Shibuzi. <laughs> Those are all in there too. <laughs> yeah. Can't go wrong there. It's uh, I know it's just astounding how much, you know, like you said, bandwidth also sometimes because if, if we're listening to music eight hours a day you know if you're listening to music for as a music supervisor and then to find bandwidth to just enjoy the music on a personal level yeah yeah you definitely have to kind of come at it, it depends on you know i kind of let i kind of let motivation lead that i try i'm that's my latest kick is to not work hard based on my motivation because those levels yeah. go up and down like crazy. So I have to keep my work consistent and regardless. Um, but I do kind of let the music listening go. So if I'm not feeling especially motivated, I go to some of those, you know, on repeat kind of things that I love. And then if I'm feeling really motivated and really pumped up, that's when I have the energy to go to the new stuff and like, you know, click on all the links and find all the pictures yeah. and all the, everything. And, you know, like listen through all this stuff that may or may not hit. <laughs> Yeah, going down the rabbit hole. Um, but yeah, Katie, and because I think you bring so much uh, experience and deep knowledge on, on the topic, but I'm just curious, one piece of advice that you would give to, you know, up and coming music supervisors or sync agents looking to break into the industry? Gosh, um, well, for sync agents, I would say, don't. It's so hard. <laughs> Uh, I might say the same thing to music supervisors, but no, um, I think for, for both, it really comes down to, um, the thing that I've been learning on, on my journey is that it comes down to just telling people how to think about you. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not out there and you're not meeting people and you're not networking, you're not telling them anything about you. So you're telling them not to think about you. <laughs> so if you get out there and you say, you know, this is the kind of story I want to work on, or, you know, this is the guy, I get so many cold emails or, you know, potential students who want to be music supervisors. And I was like this for so long where you're just like, I will take anything. Mm. And definitely do that. Take absolutely anything and everything, but you're going to have a, a more authentic story and it's going to catch the attention of the right people more. If you think about for yourself, this is the kind of music I want to work on, or this is the kind of character and story that I want to be associated with. Um, these are the kind of people I want to work with. I mean, mm. from circling back around to current events, not that I mean to take up too much more of your time by opening this can of worms, but 
for years, you know, people would have thought that the gold standard of the music industry was, or the entertainment industry was getting into Diddy's white parties. And we're maybe seeing that that was not quite the invite you wanted, you know? So like, don't be, don't be ashamed to like, not try and get into whatever the cool (laughs) thing is, if that's not what resonates with you, you know? And I think figuring out your authentic journey and like then having putting that energy into building it for yourself is going to go a lot further than taking that energy and trying to get into somebody else's world. I love that, you know, and to bookend it, Katie, because it's such a great quote. It stuck with me. But uh, when Cheryl Salt James from Salt and Peppa did the keynote at the Guild of Music Supervisors uh, summer conference a year or so ago, one of her quotes, and it's it's it still sticks with me today, and it bookends what you said is authenticity leads to longevity. And she mm. talked about her coming up in the hip hop scene and competing with Queen Latifah and all the 90s hip hoppers. And still to this day, she's a powerhouse in the, in the industry. But yeah. love what you touched on there, Katie. And um, the time flies by and we had such a great chat. I'm really stoked to be able to share this episode up and then we'll, we'll link to uh, your socials. Folks can find you. But yeah, thanks, Katie, so much for stopping by and really enjoyed our chat today. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is fun. Yes, we'll have to do it again. We'll, and we'll be talking offline about the... Uh, we have some plans. The, yes, I love <laughs> it. I love it. But yeah, very cool. Well, thank you guys for tuning in. And thank you to Katie McElvain, our special guest uh, here in the Synchro Studio. We'll catch you on the next episode. And until then, make it a great one and namaste. Go.